इसी कड़ी में आज हमारे साथ एक खास मेहमान जुड़े हैं हमारे साथ जाने माने इन्वेस्टमेंट गुरु जिम रॉजर्स जुड़े हैं उनसे हम बात करते हैं जिम थैंक्स लॉट फॉर ज्वाइनिंग अस एट सच अ शॉर्ट नोटिस एंड इट्स ऑलवेज प्लेजर हैविंग यू ऑन द शो सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल टेल मी नव यू नो जीएसटी इज अ बिग डील फॉर इंडिया आई मीन ऑब्वियसली इट्स इट्स द लार्जेस्ट टैक्स रिफॉर्म इंडिया हैज एवर सीन पोस्ट इंडिपेंडेंस एंड इट इज गोइंग टू फंडामेंटली चेंज द वे इंडियन मार्केट ऑपरेट एज अ मार्केट प्लेस इंडिया ऑपरेट सो वॉट्स यूर टेक ऑन जीएसटी Well, me here. I'm delighted to be here. I'm a fan of Z Business, as you know. Uh, GST is a miracle. Uh, I, I'm very surprised it went through, uh, and it's going to change India completely. It will make it a, in the long run. It will make it cheaper and more efficient for most businesses to to do business. It's great for India. It's, mm -hmm. I'm very very surprised. Mm. You were not expecting GST to sail through. No, well, I knew he wanted to, and I knew he had the majority. But you know, it's a big, big, big change for many people. It is a great change, but a lot of people are going to have to spend a lot of money uh, changing. But in the end, it's better for everybody. Mm. But Jim, you know, now if you if you look at the performance of Modi government, uh, and and this is a big message for global community or global investment investor community, I would say. that uh, we did demonetization uh, as a country uh, we rolled out gst and now what is on the cards is the divestment of air india which is a national carrier and uh, obviously a very sensitive topic for indians so what's your take on the reforms that has been undertaken so far by the modi government well not much has been done except gst which is huge which is huge which is a very very big thing uh, i hope that they will privatize air india i'm not sure why that's a big thing for indians it will be better for india it will be better for air india if they have to be efficient and competitive instead of being a protected industry and not offering very good service to indians and foreigners hmm. have you ever uh, traveled on air india jim yes i have yes i have and i i i prefer other airlines let's leave it at that <laughs> All right. Now Jim coming back to Indian markets and economy. First let's let's talk about the economic impact of GST. As you rightly said that it is expected to bring down uh, you know the the cost overall cost of consumption. Yeah, in fact, uh, on Z network when we spoke to the finance minister Mr. Arun Jaitley, he was very optimistic that this can actually uh, prop up the consumption and effectively prop up the growth rate also of India. Do you share that view? Well, I want to emphasize that in the short term, it's going to cost a lot of money and a lot of time for a lot of people because it's such a huge change. But in the long term, absolutely, he's right. It's one of the best things that's happened in India in a long, long time. I'm delighted. I'm surprised, but it's good for India and therefore good for the world. Mm. So, would you buy on Indian markets right now, Jim? I'm not buying anything right now, me here. I'm I'm worried about what's happening in the world. The world is overdue for a, a correction and maybe a big correction. So at the moment, I'm sitting and watching and waiting to see what happens. Mm. Yeah, in fact, I remember last time also when we discussed, you were sounding a little cautious. But uh, you know, at least for India, all the positives in the near term have been priced in. in the current valuations where indian markets are because gst was expected to sail through it did eventually with bit of hiccups uh, demonetization has been factored in the the quarterly performance of companies has been largely priced in there is one more initiative which is uh, being undertaken in india on a very urgent basis that is uh, basically improving the health of uh, public sector banks or the government owned banks in india and as you as you know that uh, you know they, they have been under cloud as far as their npas or the asset qualities are concerned now can that also be a game changer initiative for india well if he actually does it if he cleans up the banks and and they not just political play things anymore if they actually do what they're supposed to do it'll be fabulous for india you know india could be had, at times in history has been one of the greatest countries of the world You have the soil, you have the land, you have the people. You could have the banking system. I hope he cleans it up. I mean, finally, Mr. Modi's doing some of the things that I thought he was going to do three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. It sounds like he finally understands what what needs to be done for India. But back to your other point, I mean, here the market is very high, as you know. It's not as though these things are a surprise. 
That's one reason I'm worried about markets in many parts of the world. The American stock market's at an all-time high. Most of the many of the markets in Europe are at all-time highs. I don't like buying when things are making all-time highs. Mm. In fact, you are almost sounding like some of the, uh, uh, you know, I would say, big uh, domestic investors we spoke to. Even they shared your view that the caution also has to be at its peak when the prices are at its peak. But uh, like you mentioned, that you suspect a huge correction. If you can quantify in terms of percentage, what kind of correction you expect in global markets? Here, as you know, we in America. I'm going to use America since it's less sensitive. It's been over eight. It's been almost nine years since we had a big correction in the American stock market. It's well overdue. Historically, we've had them every four to eight years. When we have big corrections in America, they usually go down 40 or 50 percent. This one will go down 40 or 50 percent. It will be the worst in our lifetime because the debt, Mahir, is so, so, so much higher than it was even in 2008. Mm -hmm. So, no, but that's a that's, that's little scary. <laughs> you know, if you say 40, 50 percent correction in U.S. markets, then we can Mahir, only imagine Mahir. what will happen to the world. Mahir, it shouldn't be scary. It's happened. It's happened with great regularity since the beginning of the Republic. It would be scary if it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. If we went without having a 40 or 50 percent correct, it never happened. It happens all, not all the time, but it happens every few years. It would be very scary if it didn't happen. Now, maybe we're going to have the last gasp and a big bubble move, you know, before it pops. But mm -hmm. when it pops, it's going to go down 40 or 50 percent at least. It's going to be the worst in your lifetime. Now, Mahir, you don't have to be scared if you're prepared, if you know what's coming and you're prepared. Mm. So, Jim, now, you know, if I look at it from Indian perspective, because obviously our viewers will be more concerned about what happens in India. You know, uh, there have been two, three triggers or I would say two, three legs on which Indian markets have been running. So, one is obviously the domestic reforms uh, or the corporate performance to some extent. But a large part of Indian, Indian market or the outperformance has been actually driven by the global liquidity. And it is still chasing. In fact, as we speak, even in the month of June, the amount of money pumped into Indian markets by FIIs was record. Uh, obviously, a large part of it went into actually debt investments. But still, uh, if this tap goes dry or if the flows reverse, and since India has seen decent amount of outperformance uh, since February 2017, uh, what kind of drop can we see in India? <laughs> uh, you, you should watch the business to find out what kind of drop. <laughs> I will tell you that in the, in the developed world, it's going to be 40 or 50 percent at least because we're, we, we've had huge run-ups in debt. We're overdue for one. You just said about India, there's been huge liquidity. There's been huge liquidity all over the world. But the American Central Bank says it's going to start cutting back. Some of the European central banks have said they are going to cut back. If they do, it's going to affect everybody in the world. I mean, me here, in the last 10 years, the Western central, the developed central banks have printed staggering amounts of money. It has never happened in recorded history. Interest mm -hmm. rates are negative in some countries. This has never happened. Me here, when this changes and it goes just back to normal, a lot of liquidity is going to be drained, and it's going to affect everybody, including India. Mm, right. Now, Jim, tell me one thing. You know, one part is, and, and obviously we, you know, people who are, uh, who are active in markets or who cover markets, journalists like us, they tend to look at everything uh, from markets perspective. But on pure economic policy front, are you more clear about what Mr. Trump wants to do now than before? <laughs> Mr. Trump is not clear what he wants to do. Uh, Mr. Trump is constantly changing. I don't know what he's going to do. Uh, that's one of the problems with the world right now. And what, is, what will happen is when some things start going wrong, Mr. Trump will lash out and he won't know what he's doing and it will make it worse. You know, politicians throughout history have made things worse instead of better when problems arise. Mr. Trump will make things worse. I don't know what the problem is going to be. Well, you see, just recently with China, I mean, now he's antagonizing China again. We thought they were going to be friendly. Now he's doing his best to make them mad. This is not the way the country, America, needs to be run. Hmm. 
So, uh, you know, now obviously, I mean, it goes without saying that Mr. Trump is slightly unpredictable and, and maybe only he knows what he really wants to do. Maybe he doesn't. He did sound little furious with North Korea as well. And he, he, he sort of sounded alarm bells when he mentioned that he is running out of patience with North Korea. Uh, would you like to read between the lines? Well, I think maybe Mr. Trump is trying to, uh, you know, politicians and throughout history have attacked or had, have started out foreign uh, affairs when they're having trouble at home to distract people and to rally everybody to support him. Maybe that's Mr. Trump's plan. I don't know. I cannot imagine he's going to start a war with North Korea. Who knows? Who knows? He, he bombed Syria for no reason. He bombed uh, India, for, uh, not India, but uh, Afghanistan for no reason. So who knows what he might do if he gets angry one morning. Mm. Uh, and if he does, it's going to be very, very bad for all of us. Mm. I, I, there's no way that he can do anything and he can bomb North Korea to, to nothing. But that's not going to solve any problems. That's going to make the world much worse. Mm. So now in this, uh, so, so how are you hedging, Jim? I mean, that's an obvious question. You, you are an investment guru and you've been investing all your lifetime. Everybody wants to protect his capital. Are you sitting on cash? Are you looking at gold? Are you looking at real estate? I have a lot of U.S. dollars, Mahir, uh, I, because when the turmoil gets worse, many people look for a safe haven. They, they think the U.S. dollar is a safe haven. It's not, Mahir. America is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world, and the debts are going higher. But everybody thinks it's a safe haven, so the dollar will go higher. Uh, it might even turn into a bubble. I hope at that point I'm smart enough to sell and put my money somewhere else. I mean, it might be gold by then. Who knows where it will be if it happens that way. But at the moment, I own a lot of U.S. dollars. Mm. But you're not investing in gold at this point? I own gold, which is I think you know. I have not bought any serious gold in several years, but I haven't sold any gold. And I'm waiting. If gold does go down, below 1,000 U.S. dollars per ounce, I hope I'm smart enough to buy a lot of gold. Because before this is over, Mahir, gold is going to turn into its own bubble and go through the roof because of the problems. And when people lose confidence in governments and when people lose confidence in money, they always have turned to gold and silver. Mm. Maybe they shouldn't, but they always have. Mm. Jim, actually, you are sounding so pessimistic that, you know, it, it almost sounds like the party is coming to an end and it might come to an end pretty soon, sooner than we expect. Well, Mahir, how long do you think this party can last? The party <laughs> in America, the party's been going on for over eight years. Mm. How much longer do you think it's going to run? Maybe I should watch uh, B Business more, uh, Z Business more. Uh, definitely. Find out how long it's going to run. Mm -hmm. But, you know, now... Now, now, Jim, just to put it differently, you know, uh, apart from you, and, and you have always been a very honest uh, advisor, I would say, but whichever global investor we have been speaking to lately, uh, I mean, they share your view that, I mean, there is a lot of froth in global markets, uh, there is unpredictability about the U.S. economy. So, all that said and done, they do share a common view that if at all the world was to go under a huge correction like you have just predicted, then they would go long on markets like maybe India or, or some of the other emerging markets. Uh, is that the correct strategy at this point? Well, I don't understand that because India is making all-time highs. They're, they're, Japan is down 50%. China is down 50%. Russia is hated. There are markets that are depressed. But I don't see buying markets that are all-time highs when, when problems may, may come. Now, if India goes down a lot, sure, and Mr. Modi continues to make changes, sure, it could be very exciting. But I don't see buying a market at an all-time high to prepare for a correction. That's not the way I invest anyway. Mm, right. So, uh, you know, in fact, some of our Indian investors, they wrote to you, Jim, once you had published your views last time about India and about global markets. Uh, this time we spoke to them. Their view was that India is in a long-term sustained bull market. This could be beginning of another long bull rally that we might witness in Indian market. And at every opportunity or at every dip, you should go ahead and buy 
uh, in Indian markets. Is that a little too over optimistic? Well, I have never heard of a market that doesn't have serious corrections along the way. I, you know, in the 19th century, as America was rising, we had some big, big, serious bear markets. America became the most successful country in the 20th century. But if you never, if you never prepared for bear markets along the way, you suffered pretty badly. Now, maybe India is different. Maybe India is never going to have a serious bear market again. I'm skeptical that that will happen to any country. It has never happened to anybody in history. India maybe is a special country and maybe it will happen. I'm skeptical. <laughs> I, I quite get that. Uh, the other part, you know, as far as global uh, economic leadership is concerned, we do understand that the dollar is obviously the safe haven and it, it still remains, end of the day, the strongest and the most bankable currency in the world. You know, the way China has been uh, printing bonds, almost 11 trillion of them lately. And second, we can see those early signs of divergence between the way Europe is conducting their business and between the way US is conducting their business. There have been face-off between US and European Union as far as, as a trade body, if we see uh, both of them. What's your view on that? Is there some sort of tectonic shift which is taking place from, uh, I would say, US to European Union as far as economic leadership is concerned? Well, there certainly is, and that's a reason for worry because Mr. Trump is upsetting a lot of things, which may, may be good. I, I don't know. I'll have to leave that to, to history to determine. But as far I would just go back to China for a minute. You know, China does have debt now, Mahir. China has not had debt for decades for many historic reasons. So when the problems come, you're going to see bankruptcies in China, which is going to shock a lot of people, scare a lot of people. It'll scare me, and I know it's coming. But you're going to see anybody in China who deals with the West and who has a lot of debt is probably going to go bankrupt, or some of them will. And that's going to be a big shake, a big shake-up for much of the world. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, you see relations changing in Europe and America. You see the Middle East changing. You see right now, you know, some of the Middle Eastern countries are having a big battle with Turkey and Qatar. Uh, and who knows who, how this is going to wind up. You go back to the years before the First World War, you had all kinds of shakeups within the international uh, lineup. And the next thing you knew, we had 1914 and a horrible, crazy war. Mm. There's a lot of things that don't look good right now. <laughs> all right, so you mentioned 1940 also. I thought at least you will save that one. Are you, are you predicting that we are looking at a global conflict or some sort of thing like that? I hope not, uh, Mihir. I certainly hope not, but I'm just saying there are a lot of shakeups going on, and throughout history, before wars, we've had a lot of shakeups. Now, we don't have to have a war by any stretch. Uh, Mr. Trump, uh, I don't think his, it wants to have war, but who knows? He, he certainly has thrown some bombs around already, and he's only been there less than six months. Mm. But do you see Mr. Trump completing his term in the White House? I know that's a tough one, well, but still. Well, Mr. Trump is over 70 years old, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, most, most presidents don't start when they're 70 years old, but he, looks, he seems to be in good health. I don't see any reason he shouldn't. Uh, unless he does something foolish, it's very unlikely that he will be removed. The Republicans control the Senate. The Republicans control the House. They're not crazy. They don't want to throw out a Republican president because that won't help any of them. So, yes, unless he drops dead or gets hit by a car or something, I would suspect he would certainly finish uh, at least his first term. So, I mean, you have been watching U.S. economy and the performance of U.S. economy for very closely for quite some time. Now, you know, this whole, uh, I would say, bogey which was created around make America great again. In fact, you know, recently our Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, uh, was in U.S., and Mr. Trump gave a reference to Mr. Modi's campaign of Make in India. And he said that that is doing great and I'm going to follow you with Make America Great Again and I'm going to chase your uh, growth rate. Though, though India is likely to grow at somewhere between 7 to 8.5 percent on the GDP. Obviously, that's a far-fetched dream for U.S. at this point. But, but do you really see substance in this Make America Great Again campaign that Mr. Trump is running? Uh, no, because most of the things he says will require trade wars, and trade wars have always been disastrous for everybody, everybody concerned, and I don't know how he's going to do it 
what he says anyway without a trade war. Now, cutting taxes is great. That could help. Bringing money back into the U.S. could help. Building infrastructure could help. But to build up uh, the kind of growth he's talking about also requires his trade wars. You know, he's been adamant that he's going to have trade wars. He hasn't done it yet, but to do everything he says requires trade wars, and trade wars wind up hurting everybody, including the people who are outside the trade war. Mm. Yeah, you know, I'm referring to U.S. again and again because, uh, I mean, obviously that remains the backbone of the global markets. Now the trouble is, the way U.S. is conducting business nowadays, it's difficult to predict because with every country he is having, you know, so, so, so it starts off looking like a great chemistry, then suddenly there are certain issues which are uh, pinching issues and, uh, and there is no serious fruitful discussion. For example, uh, the H-1B visa. Now, the Indian view is, and I did speak to the finance minister uh, last week. In fact, uh, Z was the first network he spoke to before rolling out GST. He was very clear that the, uh, the migrants from India who are in U.S. on H-1B visa, they are contributing to U.S. economy. They are not illegal migrants, and we don't accept the U.S. policy on H-1B visa currently, which is being promoted by Mr. Trump. Now, that remains a sort of bone of contention between India and U.S. What is your personal view on the H-1B visa issue? and the skill skill set which is at stake. Them here, you know we need them. America uh, doesn't produce many engineers, certainly not many good engineers. We need as many foreigners, educated, qualified, capable foreigners as we can get. Uh, Mr. Trump is shooting himself, shooting us in the foot by trying to keep these people out. And you know what, if he does it, They'll go home and they'll start companies at home and then the home countries will make a lot of money and America will get nothing but more competition. It's madness. It's absolute madness. But, you know, Mr. Trump was elected president, so he can do what he what he can get away with. Mm. Coming back to India. Now, now, let's come back to India. because Our audience is also largely Indian. Uh, what's your take on uh, the Make in India campaign and the other reforms undertaken by the Modi government? Well, I hope he can do it. Uh, I've been hearing this sort of thing from India for, for many, many, many years, and I guess you have too. So far, it's mainly been hype. You know, back in uh, 1990, India said, oh, we got to start having privatization and, and doing what everybody else in the world. Well, that was 27 years ago. I think there's been one, one or two privatizations since then. I've heard this from India for many, many years. India is a wonderful, wonderful country to visit. If you can only visit one country, you should visit India. I hope it happens. I hope it happens. But I've been hearing this. I'm older than you, so I've been hearing it a lot longer than you have. Mm, that's true. <coughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, it is slightly confusing since you mentioned that 40, 50 percent drop in global markets is possible. If that is to happen, then do you feel and do you believe that Fed will be able to remain on the trajectory that they are predicting right now about the rate hikes in U.S.? I want you to go back, me here and just look. It always happens that we have 40 to 50 percent corrections. It's been going on since the beginning of the American Republic. Nothing unusual about that statement. It would be unusual if we didn't have it. But, no, what will happen is when things start getting bad, then the Federal Reserve will panic. They're, you know, these central bankers in Washington are made up of bureaucrats and academics. They don't know what they're doing. They will panic. They will turn around and do everything they can to stop the decline. It will cause a rally for a while. But the forces are over. There's nothing they can do. I mean, the debt is gigantic. The amount of money that's been printed is staggering. It's, you know, it, throughout history, Mahir, markets have overwhelmed central banks when the central banks were doing the wrong thing. This is not unusual. It, it may sound like a strange statement to you, but it's the way the world has always worked. Hmm. <coughs> so, you know, to cut the long story short, currently what is the best strategy that a global investor should have, number one? And number two, if you were to pick up three bright spots in the global markets, equity markets, first let's talk about equity markets, three bright spots, in equity markets globally, uh, which they would be? Well, given the, that I expect the U.S. to have problems, and it's the largest market in the world, and that means that other Europe will too, so 
know, it's hard to find any bright spot. If you know how to sell short, you might uh, make a lot of money going into this kind of thing. If you know about agriculture, agriculture has been very depressed. In, in India, you know, agriculture at times has been a phenomenal industry. Mr. Modi says he's helping agriculture now. He's not doing enough, but agricultural stocks around the world may be a place to be. Selling short, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, the Japanese market, the Chinese market, these are markets that are down a lot from their all to the Russian market. I guess the third would be the Russian stock market. Learn about Russia. Mm. One last question on India, Jim. Now, you know, there are two industries which have actually been the poster boys of the new age India or the success story that India is all about. One is the IT industry. We did touch upon it. Second is the telecom industry. Now, in telecom, we have our own, I won't say problem, but there is a shift which is taking place in telecom. There is a massive price war which is going on. All the incumbent players have been crying that the new entrants have actually spoiled their balance sheets. But these two remain the largest success stories of India touching masses. What's your take on the IT industry in India and on the telecom industry in India? Oh, the IT industry and telecom, I mean, the IT industry in India is one of the envious of the world. I mean, you keep cranking out these engineers who do wonderful things. So I, I don't know, I don't have any investments there right now, but you keep cranking out uh, engineers who can do a wonderful job. So I don't see why that would stop. And likewise with telecom, uh, the market is opening up. That's great for India. India's been a horribly protected, overprotected economy for many, many, many decades. Mm. Any opening up that takes place in India is good for India and good for the world. But remember, India also has a lot of debt. So before when we were talking about markets and India stock markets at an all-time high, the Indian, India now has a lot of debt too. So mm. one has to be worried. You cannot grow at a rapid rate historically when you have a lot of debt. Mm, that's true. All right, Jim, uh, as always, it's a pleasure having you on Z Business and uh, we really thank you for your admiration of uh, Z Business and your time. I know you are traveling, you just landed in China. I hope things are fine there because there, there seems to be some sort of tiff going on between India and China on the border, but I hope that remains limited. Thank you so much. Well, that, that tiff has been recurring for over 50 years. I hope it's just a small, a small tiff. The world doesn't need any more tears. Certainly not between India and China. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jim. Hope to catch you soon. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mahir.